right, welcome to this episode of the Justice Team Podcast. This is Bob Simon, your host, and we have the esteemed Josh Ritter on today. And, and Josh is a preeminent criminal lawyer. He's got a lot of bad guys off for very good things, and a lot of good people off for things that they were accused of. Only accused. Only accused. Um, and he's transitioning into, he's now trans plaintiff lawyer for civil. Yes, to dip in my toes in, actually getting thrown in the deep end, but yeah. learning. And he's also, the, tell, him, tell him the show that you host where everybody sees and knows your face from. Uh, thank you. It's called uh, The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily. I've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it's really starting to gather an audience. So please check it out. Love it. And I've you know, been lucky enough to be on the show to talk civil crossovers. We're going to talk some criminal civil crossovers today with Josh and how the two are a lot, a lot intertwined and how now Josh is stepping in for a lot of victims on the civil side and, and trying those cases and what that looks like. Um, again, you can find any of our shows on justiceteamnetwork.com if you have any questions or any like cases that you want to talk to me about or Josh. But, you know, Josh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is, you know, how in our practices as a civil trial lawyer, personal injury lawyer, how can we use, um, you know, a criminal lawyer as an asset or a liaison in some of these cases? Sure. I think in more ways than people realize, if they've been doing plaintiff's work, civil work for a while, they, they might not be able to wrap their heads around it. But that was one of the reasons why I joined uh, El Dabe Ritter, um, because we did see a need uh, for criminal um, representation. One, you know, it just grows the services that you're allowed to present to your clients as far as helping them out. Sometimes there's crossover where not even it's directly related to the case while why your client is in your office, you know, perhaps they were hurt in an auto accident. Oh, but by the way, I picked up a drug case that has nothing to do with that, but I need help and you're the only lawyer that they know. So instead of walking them out the door to someone else, you can represent them themselves. But it also is helpful um, in a number of different ways in facilitating the civil case. One of those has to do with restitution, which I know we're going to talk about, but I'm doing a restitution case right now uh, where as the civil attorney, I am representing our victim in criminal court in a hearing to argue a very significant amount of restitution, which is then going to be very helpful in the civil side of things of actually collecting on that. Yeah. So what's how can a injured victim, they know they have the civil case or they're, they're getting compensated from that individual or mostly their insurance for that individual. But if that act came upon criminally like a DUI, for instance. Right. So what's the difference? How can they then get this money from the insurance company, say they had a $100,000 policy limit, but then go to the criminal courts to get you know restitution, kind of define it, and then how does that interplay? Right. And you're right to point out that there has to be a criminal case involved, obviously. So yes, you're going to see this most often in cases where it's a DUI causing injury. Your firm has the injury case. But then that person, the, the, the defendant in your civil case, is also defending criminally in that the state is going after him for the DUI. What happens in restitution criminally is that they will have a hearing. Every victim is entitled to restitution, and they're entitled to their out-of-pocket expenses. So it's not going to include things like punitives, obviously, or, or future kind of care, future uh, you know, pain and suffering regarding even mental health. But what did they pay out of pocket? What did they have to pay for the ambulance? What did they have to pay for their uh, initial providers? All of that stuff, you know this, they get huge bills. And a lot of that can be negotiated with insurance companies. But in the criminal world, they don't really care about that. They care about the fact that this victim is either out of pocket a significant amount of money or owes a significant amount of money because they've been handed this exorbitant bill from their medical provider and I have, like I said, I referenced earlier, I have this case right now where we've presented a seven-figure bill for a gentleman who was run over in a DUI and had significant brain injuries that the judge is just going to make that order. And we're not going to have to argue about liability and negligence and everything mm -hmm. else. It's just a matter of you've already been found guilty for the DUI. Restitution, according to the law, says you now owe him for his out Yeah, and what I think a lot of people don't realize is that you – can what's called double dip. I mean, you can, the insurance company cannot say, settle with us for the policy limit and waive restitution. They can't do that. Correct. Right? Cannot do it. In fact, that's what we're dealing with right now is that the way that the judge sees it, and I think accurately so, is no, this person's got a bill. It's like any other bill. I don't care what their insurance did. Mm -hmm. 
in dealing with a medical provider. He still owes that in theory to this medical provider and well, I'm going to well, order yeah, that no, restitution. If you, yeah, if you settle even with say AAA insurance and they have a hundred thousand policy limit, they cannot make it contingent on you releasing a hundred percent. Yeah. The, 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 the wrongdoer in this case. Now, another thing people don't realize in California and some other States is guess what else is a bill? The attorney's fees you had to pay. Right. So if you're working on a contingency fee and say it was a million dollar settlement for the policy limits, that's, you know, if you're doing a third, 333000 that's also you can go to restitution and say medical bills and attorney's fees. Right. What are you out of pocket? Yep. How, because it's about making that person whole. And that's all. It's a very blunt tool in the criminal court. It's just how do we make this person completely whole for the damage that you have caused to them through your crime? Great. Okay. Another way that we see this all the time is, hey, I have a client walk into my office and they got into a crash through no fault of their own but they got picked up for a DUI, right? Right. So maybe they were just sitting in a parked car and hit, still a DUI. right? Um, so it's like, okay, what happens in that situation? So we engage a criminal lawyer to help the process, you know, kind of how, how does that go? And then talk to us about what expungement is, because sometimes we get broad cases and clients have prior felonies that are, can come into play at the, at the civil trial, unless it's not a felony anymore, or under certain circumstances. Right. So how do you as a criminal lawyer help us with that process? Yeah, it's all about kind of mitigating whatever damage the criminal case might have to your client in, and then helping you facilitate getting the largest amount of return for them. So you're right, somebody's hit, maybe they were sitting in their car, if they get picked up for a DUI, I'm sure that's going to be used as leverage but with by the insurance companies who you're working with about how it's going to affect their damages. You don't want that, so we need to somehow clear up that underlying, maybe connected criminal case so that your client is not hindered in any way in collecting fees. Expungement is another way of doing that. Your client has some felony, some misdemeanor from years ago that you know is going to become an issue. You can go in and try to get that expunged. And, and the expungement laws are a little funny because everybody's entitled to do it. So some people think, well, I've got a really, I've got a strike felony. I can't get that. Yes, you can. You can petition the court. Now, it may get denied. I'm not saying that you're entitled to an expungement, but you're entitled to ask for it. And many times people, I have them come into my office and they say, I tried to get an expungement. I filed the paperwork. Nothing happened with it. Having a lawyer in court to actually argue these things can yeah. go a long way. Yeah. I found a lot of times in our practice, we engage, you know, your firm and others is we'll just as we'll say, hey, we'll give you the payment for what you need out of our attorney's fees. So again, it doesn't hurt the client. Yeah. Which is like, hey, this is something else, or it's a case advance cost of that client to hire a criminal lawyer they would never otherwise be able to maybe afford at yeah. that moment, right? I, along those lines, I have a case right now where somebody came into me. He's got a very serious matter that he needs dealing with, um, and he has a civil case that's entirely unrelated. That he was in a horrible accident and lost his eye, and I told him he doesn't have money though. He's not cash, you know, cash flow is a problem for him, put it that way. I told him, go, go talk to your uh, plaintiff's attorney and talk about borrowing against your, yeah. your future fees. And that's a, that's a loan that my understanding is a lot of people are willing to give to him, especially in a case that appears to be as solid as his. So he's in the process of doing that right now so that he can pay us the fees to handle his criminal mm -hmm. unrelated criminal case and it's not going to be an issue with him because it's going to get paid off by his civil case. Yeah, and you know, in California and a lot of other jurisdictions, attorneys if you're representing a client can can C A N loan their clients money as long as one thing is true, you cannot tie it to interest. You can never give an interest loan to your clients. You know, if you're worried about ethics, you call the ethics, you know, hotline at your state bar. You can use a third party to do these things, um, to loan your clients money to get what they need. Uh, Josh, just a real quick question. Has anybody ever showed up to your office with a dead body in the trunk? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I have attorney client privilege that I cannot answer that. Oh, question. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so something else, you know, pleading the fifth. Yeah. You know, what, what is pleading the fifth me? As a criminal attorney, Anytime somebody is under indictment or possibly under indictment, we don't want them speaking to authorities for any reason whatsoever. And that doesn't have to do with they're guilty and what they're going to say is going to somehow hurt them. It's just you got to think the only reason they're being interviewed by law enforcement is law enforcement is trying to prove their case. And if they're interviewing your client as a suspect, that's what they're trying to do. So 
if your client also has a civil case going on and they're subject to depositions, how do you handle that? And I handle it on a case by case basis. If I feel that it's not going to open them up to any kind of criminal liability for them to go ahead and testify, but if it's at all connected, I had lots of times have to shut it down. And we've been able to get delays in discovery. Yep. It, it, I, my understanding is it can't go on forever because sometimes these criminal cases can drag on surprisingly, but there's no way. I, I mean, I, it's tail wagging the dog here. I realize you've got a civil case and you want to deal with that. I'm trying to keep you out of prison. Yeah, and a lot of times the civil case will be stayed until the criminal case is completed. And sometimes judges will let it carry on just depending on, on yeah. circumstances. You know, in California, in the civil case, you can use it against them that they pled the fifth and refused to testify. Different criminal, it's a different standard. So it's kind of that, you know, you, you got to toe the line there. And just for our listeners, something you have to like take into consideration, if you're going pursuing a case where the defendant has insurance coverage, there's a cooperation clause for the insured who the defendant is to cooperate with their insurance. And if you keep pushing so hard against this they can't testify, plead the fifth deal. We're going to take like a default judgment against you or really go hard against that in the trial. You may be eviscerating coverage for yeah. your client. So it's just, you, again, this is these are things that you should be on the same side of the criminal attorney for the defendant because guess what happens? Practical, ladies and gentlemen, I've done this with Josh in other cases where Josh, if he's representing the defendant as a criminal lawyer, guess what he can help you do? put pressure on the insurance company for the civil case to get a resolve because it helps you, right? Yeah. How yeah. does it help the the defendant who's charged with a crime to get the civil case resolved? It just, it just, it, it, now they're unencumbered to defend themselves. And now they don't have to worry about being subject to depositions or inter interrogatories or anything else that's going to, you know, lift up their skirt as it were, before yeah. they're going to perhaps defend themselves in a criminal case. And we just, it it's, it's, uh, I think more than anything, it's about eliminating the distractions. Yeah. And I mean, does it also help whenever you're going, you know, working out a plea deal and say, look, your honor, they also already resolved the civil case. Does oh. that go into consideration? Too? Oh, yeah, 100%. In, in, in fact, a lot of times attorneys will come in and say, my, my client has entered into a civil compromise, and especially in cases dealing with hit and run where you're not... The, the crime itself wasn't like a DUI where the state might be more concerned with the behavior, but it's somebody got into an accident, didn't stick around. Lots of times they'll approach the, the, def, the not the defendant, but the victim in the criminal case and say, can we settle this? They settle it. They go into court and they ask for a civil, civil compromise, essentially saying to the criminal judge, what, 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 yeah. why are we getting involved here? We've, we've handled this. They've been made whole. No reason to get anybody else's hands dirty. Wow, you know, that's just another example of how practically to use this stuff and what, you know, what you can lean in on the criminal side too is if people, you know, you do a lot of, um, how we call them, sex act cases? Like yeah. What, kind of just describe those cases that you work on. And then the question I'm going to ask you is, you know, how can you help those people you're representing find a, find a lawyer that represents them as like personal counsel to put on pressure yeah. to the insurance company? Yeah. Um, you know, it's the day and age that we live in that you, I, I have seen a change in my practice over the last few years that we're getting a lot of calls from people who there's allegations of some sort of sexual misconduct, whether that's taking place at work in a dating relationship or otherwise that we're just getting more calls and, um, you know, putting aside all of the politics behind all of that, many times when I get approached, there's also a tangential civil issue because mm -hmm. Perhaps there's a threat of a lawsuit, or perhaps this has to do with their employment, and there's mm -hmm. some issues uh, connected to that. So, yes, I, you know they're they're going to need to need to get a lawyer involved to help them on that civil side of things, so that I, as their criminal attorney, can concentrate on how do we handle yeah. keeping them out of prison. Yeah, and then on the civil side, so what my firm does, and I do specifically, is we'll represent some of these people that are friends, family referrals from firms like yours for free but on the contingency of if there is a bad bad faith action against the insurance company. So if the insurance company doesn't try to do the right thing and at least do the civil side and settle with the victim, then you can step in the shoes and we can sue the insurance company directly. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's a big segue. I mean, there's a big lead into that because I, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, your homeowner's insurance will cover you for any negligent act. You know, if you negligently thought that you... <laughs> 
didn't transmit herpes to your to your one night stand. I mean, they had these right. herpes cases. I yeah. saw them pop up and stuff like this. But your homeowner's insurance can cover that if it's not specifically excluded. And again, if you have an attorney or acting as your personal counsel saying, insurance company, here's the policies, find them all, these apply, pay, pay, pay. If you don't pay, my client, the insured, is getting screwed over on this. We're going to sue you if you don't pay. Yeah. Right. That's, that's fascinating stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's a whole bucket there of... Uh, you know, again, it's just like my goal in all these is get the victim compensated. Right. Right. That's your job is to protect the interest on the criminal side of that individual. But there's no harm in getting this victim compensated. Right. Right. So, yeah, I think the big vehicles for all of our listeners is restitution is a big play. I think the use of personal counsel is a big play. I think expungement or lessening. The exposure is a huge play for us in some of these cases. Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of us see, you know, we do a lot of cases where there's a lot of, you know, meth is a big problem in the United States. And a lot of our clients end up having meth in their system or in their background. And it's usually a harm to themselves type issue. But we got to get these things dealt with. Yeah. And get it out the door. Yeah. yeah and, it, and, and to help you out too, to just have your client focusing their efforts on what you need them for to in their own plaintiff's case you know the, you you need a, a a clean client client who's not worried about all sorts of criminal liability in order to participate in that discovery process and perhaps trial and you don't want to be do that, doing that with them worrying about where are they going after this wow interesting well what, are there any we talked about um kind of the the sexual assault allegation stuff, anything else new that you've seen an uptick in or new areas of law that you've been presented with, you know, as you've been making this switch over to, you know, helping the victims get compensated on the civil side? I think where you see it most often is, is like we said, that in the, in the sex cases, in the, in the traffic cases that involved crimes, like I said, hit and runs, DUIs, um, but as as you were talking, one one thing I wanted to kind of go back to is talking about uh, restitution. I was a DA for for ten years before I became a defense attorney, and now getting into the plaintiffs' world. But when we would have civil attorneys come in, how many cases in, do you think you've tried? By the way, fifty, sixty. Damn, yeah, nice. I think so. Um, I mean, you're doing like one a month when, when, yeah. you're, when you're first thrown into the DA's, DA's office. office. They, yeah, they just, go, they just go. hand you a file. I literally got handed a trial day one of working on the job. I lost, by the way, <laughs> but anyhow. Um, but you get these civil attorneys who come in on a restitution case, and, and I don't know what it is. Prosecutors just have a, a natural kind of cynicism towards this and a distrust of these plaintiff's attorneys when they come in because they view it as – Oh, they're just after money and I'm trying to pursue justice. And this guy's just after money and they don't, they're hesitant to allow you to get involved. And I, I guess I want your listeners to understand, be cognizant of that, that, you know, when you're, when you're coming in and you're the plaintiff's attorney and you're trying to represent your client as a victim in a criminal case, just make friends with that prosecutor. They can be your yeah. best friend and, and let them know that you're not here to, to, to throw elbows or get involved or tell them how to run their case. You're just trying to protect your client's interests. And they'll find it helpful, especially if you're willing to provide them with yep. the information that you may have come up with. That's a good point for our listeners. You know, we do a lot of the same things where the injury or death was the result of a, an indictment, right? So we have to work with the DA to make sure that there's a pass through of information, we're here for you, you know, and sometimes there's information the DA can give you about certain things. You know, a lot of times the police are doing the investigation for you while the police report's not read in the investigation. You know, if you play nice, you may be able to get stuff that helps you on the civil side um, to get things resolved. So DAs, defense lawyers, your best friends, this is all a reciprocal business. Um, but yeah, it's all about playing nice, I do yep. think. Uh, you know, and is there any other, you know, I know some notable notable cases that your firm has worked on. Are you at liberty to say who your past clients were, or, or can I just say things and you don't say anything or plead the fifth? Yeah, I can't say. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. That's okay. <laughs> if uh, I did my job well, they especially yeah. don't want to know that they came <laughs> to see me. Yeah. Well, some of them, one of your partners was in trial for a long time with one of the most recent ones. Yeah, yeah, I... Yeah, you could probably say that you one. Say I wasn't that. around for that case, but yeah. They, yeah, they that was the, the Harvey super. Weinstein stuff. Yeah. I saw a lot of that. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, some notable cases that you guys have been part of. Um, so, yeah. So, um, you know, if anybody needs to find you, Josh, how, how best do they contact you? 
Uh, look up my website, uh, El Dobby Ritter. Uh, Trial Lawyers is where they can find us, erlawyers.com. Or check out, I have a website too, which talks about my my trial work and other stuff that I've been involved in, including the podcast at joshuaritter.com. Yeah, and if anybody wants to check out that podcast, it's it's fascinating, it's wonderful, and I think they have over 5 million subscribers for, yeah, for that yeah. one. So it's a big deal. Well, Josh, thanks for coming on. And this is the episode of the Justice Team Podcast doing criminal civil crossovers. If you have any questions or comments or case advice, go to justiceteamnetwork.com. Thank you for listening and viewing if you're on YouTube. Thank you very much.